We gather to sing all His praises. We gather to worship the King. We gather to hear of His precious love, His grace into all lives He brings. We would see Jesus the Savior. We would see Jesus in you. We would see Jesus no other. My morning everyone and it's Christmas Eve here we have already uh, had a wonderful time in our service and we do say Merry Christmas to everyone as you joined us today and you'll be watching this program at some point but it Merry Christmas and today is Christmas Eve and we have shared in candle lighting today uh, we shared in offering and giving and we've looked at the Advent again as we continue through the month of December and we sang songs, and we've certainly celebrated Jesus as he is the reason for the season. We're going to look today in the final message for the Christmas season. We're going to be in John chapter 1. We're going to read several verses today, a lengthy passage, but I feel like it would, to see the picture that we're looking at today, uh, as we opened our worship time today, I read from the Matthew passage uh, today, describing the Matthew version or the look upon the birth. And then we know that the Luke version, the nativity and sharing all those things. But many times we know that John 1 gives this theological look to the birth. And we know it's all theology, but today it, it takes the birth of. You don't see the shepherds mentioned. You don't see the wise men mentioned. But as you do see the wonderful description, as John put it, in the presentation of being the son of man, the son of God, the king. Matthew presented him as the king. Mark presented him as the servant. Luke presented him as the son of man. John presents him truly with the message of the son of God. And you think of the son of God as he took on flesh and he came as a babe in a very humble birth. And was here for us. And we want to look at that today in John chapter 1. I hope you'll find it and read it with us as we find that. My review for the month, as we've looked at these series of, uh, through this series, we've been thinking of the miracle of Christmas. Many preachers will come up with various ideas and things, but as I plan today, our plan through the month and looking at that, you know, you, you, you find certain issues God speaks to you and to share, but you know, you you, you share when you talk about the miracle Christmas, there are not many that would just take those sermons on and go, hey, we, we don't like that, or we don't like that part, or we don't like it. The problem is not the fact that you accept that it was a miracle, but the fact that you accept it more than head knowledge. Many times it is accepted as head knowledge because it's, 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 the, it's the history that's there. And that Jesus went, we think of B.C. and A.D. But my prayer is that it's not just the mystery or the miracle of Christmas to just be the knowledge, but for it to be a heart knowledge, not just a head knowledge. And that's my prayer. But as we think of the miracle of Christmas, as we've looked at it for these Sundays, we've looked, first of all, at the miracle of the moment. God brought jesus to this earth right at the time he planned the miracle of the moment put everything in motion had everyone that they needed to be and at the right time it was a miracle of the moment then the miracle of the message enough said there the miracle of the message god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son the great new testament writer paul later said i preach the gospel and i'm not ashamed of it the death, the burial, and the resurrection, the message. And we look at the method. Many would look because of even the prophecies and the things that would come. What? Why did this happen this way? 
Many would eat the main thought many times would be thinking, we need a king. We need a person who's going to come in and take over everything. But we see the miracle in that message. We saw the miracle of the message. We don't understand those times. And I hope you'll understand just this one thought about review from that. We don't understand God's ways as he works in our daily things. We trust him. We put our faith in him. But his ways are not our ways. We shared that last week in the miracle of the methods, or the miracle of the method. But today, on Christmas Eve, we want to look at the miracle of the manger. Now, preacher, you said in John chapter 1 that the manger is not mentioned. Isn't that kind of an interesting thing? The preacher's going to have the miracle of the message and then not read Luke chapter 2. But you'll see that John 1 fits today with the message that God's given me to share. The miracle of the manger. Let's look at John chapter 1 now. John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from John, who, who sent from God, whose name was John. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor the will of flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Let's pray together. Father, we ask your blessing upon the time as we share today. What a, what a special time it is to be gathered together today in a time of worship on Christmas Eve, joining in family and joining our hearts together, Lord, as we celebrate you. Lord, for these moments today, I pray that you'll use me for your glory and I pray that I'll say the words that I should say, and I want to be an encouragement, but also I want to be given direction. I want to move for even decisions, Lord, out there where folks may be looking or maybe within our uh, service today. Lord, I pray that you'll bless this time. Thank you for your word, this special passage. In Jesus' name, amen. When we think of the miracle of the manger, the miracle of the manger, in the introduction, I mentioned that the manger was not in John 1. I did that with a little tricky because it exactly is in John 1. Now, it doesn't mention the stable, does it? It doesn't mention Mary and Joseph by that sense. But did you catch it when we were read, reading through it where it said, And the Word was made flesh. So it does mention the manger, doesn't it? At that point in Bethlehem, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. He was the Son of God that took on the form of man in a very humble setting. But he came for us. The miracle of the manger. You remember in the story that Mary and Joseph had traveled, and they came to the point, and they knocked at the door to find some room in the inn. And there was no room 
in the end. And they went and found the manger. And what a miracle was there and to take place that very evening. The miracle of birth. Now, the miracle of the baby being born, born of a virgin, born of a virgin, just as God had planned. Joseph being the obedient one who followed those things that were contrary even to the system and to the law and took Mary facing those things that could be what we might put with the term uh, social things that might happen. But Joseph obeyed. Joseph was in that place that he should have been. Mary was there. And the birth occurred. The miracle of the manger. But today as we think of the miracle of the manger, I want to say a blessing, right, or a praise. Think of the miracles that may be watching today or here within our service. There's a song that's a favorite of this church. A miracle in every pew. I shared with a young man this week who had made some tough choices facing consequences of some of those. And it's, as I was sharing, I think he thought there would be maybe a step of, maybe a point of judgment, maybe. But his eyes and his eyes and the tears came when I said, "Except I'm not. I'm sharing this in love. Except for the grace of God, where would we all be?" And we think about that. The miracles that come are our lives being changed. Our lives being new, old created new. Why? Because of the miracle that was in the manger. Now, it wasn't a little baby there that stayed, was it? That manger, the miracle, that babe grew and was a perfect son to Mary and Joseph. And even in the time when he went to the temple, and you remember they lost him? Remember that? They lost him. And they came back. You remember the statement he said to them? He said, why are, you, why are you looking for me? I'm about my father's business. You, you understand? You get that? But the birth was there. The miracle of the manger. And then we see those years that we don't even know about, we don't hear his written things about Jesus, but we know he was there and he's fallen. And, in that time when he, and when it came to the time to approach John the Baptist, as we have shared even during this month of December and Christmas, as he came to him, and he came to the point to be baptized, he could have said in his power, John, I'm here. But you remember what happened? You remember what John the Baptist told him? He said, you need to be baptizing me, not me baptizing you. But Jesus said, I am here. I'm a follow in obedience. And when he did, and he went into the water, John baptized him. He came forth and remembered the spirit and the picture of the Trinity when you have the voice and you had the dove and you had the son. A pitcher. And he went on and he carried out that ministry without sin. He faced a, a mock trial. He went to Calvary. He went to the tomb. But the tomb is empty, praise the Lord. But the miracle of the manger. He did come, didn't he? Thank the Lord. And there are miracles that we all have here and that we are and this preacher is one. And if you're saved through the, by faith through Christ and that's the only way, then you're a miracle. Because we're not born into this world to all of a sudden one day be good because we're not going to be that without Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life. But if that miracle, the manger, we know and accept, as he lived his life, when we move out of that manger, here's some things we want to look about today. The miracle of the manger. Number one, we want to look at some astonishing claims. As Jesus moved with his ministry, not only was there that manger, the miracle of the manger, 
there was that wonderful miracle as he ministered. And as he began to minister, do you remember some of the things that started happening? He would make a claim and say, I am the bread. Remember? You that are hungry can come to me. And I'm only going to touch a few of them. But he said, I am the bread of life. Do you also remember when he, when he ran into the, the, at the person at the well? You remember that? And he came to him and there was, a, there was almost a part of go, well, you don't want to talk to me. But Jesus said to her, made that same claim, an astonishing claim. Not only was he the bread, but that he was what? You remember? Hey, I am the living water. You come unto me, and you'll thirst no more. Isn't that wonderful? Jesus made that claim. And we've already shared today. Think of this claim, that those religious leaders, picture it now. We see it sometimes in some of the uh, movie stories and things as we read. We'll see the crowds gathering, and we'll see that little dark emblem, and we'll see those religious leaders gathering. Can you imagine them back totally living under the law and all the things that they were confused by, by the system, and Jesus saying all those things? And do you remember when they came and they accused Look, you are saying things. It's blasphemy. But Jesus was only given the way, wasn't he? He was given. He said, I am not come to destroy the law, but I am come to fulfill the law. And Jesus totally stunned them with this statement that we've already shared today. But I want to repeat it. Jesus said to them in his teaching, he said, no man can come to the Father except through me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the light of the world, isn't he? Darkness, but Jesus came and brought light to a dark world. Even as we think of the candle lighting and the thing we did, the lighting we have and the lights and the candles, they're all beautiful and they're symbolic and all those things, but they are to point and give a picture of we celebrate the true light, and that's Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Jesus made some astonishing claims in his ministry, but folks, he was here under the authority of who? His Father. He said consistently, I am here on a mission. You remember when he was crossing the waters and one of the times of the storms? And he was asleep in the boat, remember? You remember? He was asleep in the boat. And they were all like, well, here's an interesting note to that. Think about this. And I had this pointed out to me early in my ministry, and I love it. You know why Jesus was resting? Well, he'd been all day preaching and he was tired. You know why he was resting? You know how he was, why he was calm? Because he wasn't going to die out there in that boat. Now think about it. Now don't, don't be looking at me like, whoa, wait a minute, preacher. No, he knew he wasn't going to die out there in the boat because you know what he had to do? He had to go to Calvary. And he had to die on the cross. That was what had been chosen. But out there, the disciples were confused. Wait a minute, he was resting, and we're out here about to die. The ship's going in the waves. But as he had pointed out, in any situation that he dealt with with nature, what did they see that he could control even that? But yet he knew, as one of my dear pastor friends used to say, he knew he would land on the other side. Why? Because his feet were going to have to keep moving, and he would be moving right on in into those days where he would go and die on Calvary. You think about that. No Calvary without the manger. Jesus made those claims through his life. You know, he even said so many things that later at the end, do you remember the disciples started to ask things? And he would say, I could not give it all to you at the same time. Why? You remember? Because he, they couldn't understand it. And they couldn't receive it all. So he gave them those nuggets and those stories and those things and he told them, but he was making things. And you'd imagine those people that were ready to take him down. The astonishment by those people that you're saying, you're God, and you're this, and you're here the will of the Father. But we know he was, don't we? 
And let's say on Christmas Eve today, praise the Lord, we believe those astonishing claims. Don't we? Number two, there were staggering implications. Staggering implications. There were astonishing claims given, but they were staggering implications. And what we mean by the staggering implications, when we look at the things, Jesus didn't just say those things as just words. Those were words of truth. Those were words of action. A person that believes in me, I'm not come, I'm not come like the thief. The implications of that statement, I'm not come to steal, kill, and destroy as the devil who that's a picture of. I'm come to give life and to give it more abundantly. Staggering things. Staggering implication of this life from a manger. Do you remember? the? Uh, uh, just give you one illustration. Do you remember when he came up and the, and the demonic was running, the, the person filled with demons were running everywhere. Do you remember what jumps out at that story to me? Number one, that he was in his right mind after Jesus showed up. And then he went on and told everybody. Could you imagine some of the folks in the communities were like going, oh, wait a minute. That, that's the guy. That's the guy. But he wasn't the same guy, was he? Because Jesus showed up. But you know in that story, and people live in deception today, but even in that story, you know what those spirits in there looked and said? You know what they showed through that story? They recognized Jesus. They knew who he was. They knew who he was. Even the demons know his power. And one day they're going to be put away for eternity. When Jesus moves, there are staggering implications. I'm able to hear many times see some sad things recently, but I'm able to hear in just this week I had a young lady tell me she's going to be able to go first pass from a situation she's been in where she is now. She's going to be able to go home and the first thing she's going to be able to hear about is to, a testimony of her, of her father who had just got saved. Just got saved at Christmas time. Hadn't been able to see him in almost a year. And they're going to be able to go. And she said, that's going to be my Christmas gift. Coach. Call me coach. But that, that's it. And, and you think about that. You know what that was? That was a life-changing experience. Not because of what that man had built up. Not because just the season of the year. But that was a life-changing experience. An implication, again, from the miracle of the manger and Calvary and the belief. And thank God he's not in the tomb. Because Paul preached that it's death, burial, and resurrection. And he's at the right hand of the Father. Number three as we close. Not only astonishing claims, not only staggering implications, but there must be the consideration of faithful choices. As Jesus talked to his disciples, and he would, even before that, he would minister and he would see it, and you remember he would come to some and they would, they would not heed to his message, would they? There are choices to those. You hear the message and you don't respond. Here's the question we leave today. Do you believe? In the very beginning of the message today, I said not a head knowledge, but a heart knowledge. Do you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead? Have you admitted that you're a sinner? Have you believed in Jesus Christ and you confess? Simple. But you can't do that without belief. Believe in the one from the manger who is now seated at the right hand of the Father making intercession for us. You know, Jesus asked his disciples in the relationship of belief. He said, you remember? He said, who do you say I am? And you say, wait a minute now. Those disciples were with him. They knew who he was. Have you ever thought about that, the way Jesus would teach? But he had a way, didn't he? He said, who do you say I am? You remember some said he was John the Baptist. You're John the Baptist again, like here was John, and you didn't get that whole picture, but John the Baptist. 
Some say you're Elijah. You remember that? Said you're Elijah. Some said you're Jeremiah or a prophet. He said, who do you say I am? You remember Thomas doubted. You remember Thomas later on, even after the resurrection? These men were human. Thomas doubted and said, until I see, G until I see the wounds. Even after he had been crucified and died and rose again, Thomas said, I, want, I'm gonna, I got to see it. They're human, weren't they? When Jesus said that, but you remember in the question that Jesus would give them, who do you say I am? One of our favorites spoke up, didn't he? Peter. And he gave the strong statement that you're Christ. You're Messiah. You know, Jesus gave commendation to that statement. He said, Peter, that's exactly it. And upon this rock, I'll build my church. Not the rock of a formal church. Not Peter in a position of a formal position in a church. But the rock mentioning being the rock, Jesus. Upon this rock, I will build my church, being Jesus. Jesus is the rock. We make no mistake when the hymn writer put, Rock of ages, cleft for me because he's the rock. He makes no mistake when someone says, When I'm having struggles and trials in the old Southern Gospel song, when he said, I go to the rock of my salvation because he is the rock. And you can go to him. But please go to him as one of his children. Remember in our opening verses today, we said, He gave the power to become the sons of God. How is that? By belief. You become those sons and children of God by belief. You cannot come unto him with that without the belief. But know today, in this Christmas Eve time, our prayer is that you believe. Not in a season, as it's a wonderful time. And as we pray and we go our way today, there'll be wonderful showing of spirit and giving and fellowship, and all those things. But the blessing of Christmas, if there would be one person today, if you're looking, at the, looking through this time and seeing this, and you don't know him as your personal Savior, that you trust him. Do you believe? Uh, as Jesus said to the disciples, do you know who I am? I ask today. Not with the authority of our Savior, but I do ask today. Do you believe? Who do you think Christ is? Was he a good man? Was he a person you see that just happened to have in a picture with some guys and they roam around, he has a beard? And I don't say that disrespectfully, but is that, you would be surprised how many of them is the knowledge of Jesus or a good man in history or other religions that say this but never put him in the position of being the Son of God. But Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto him it's said by the Father. And we've stated that today, but it's true and it's fact. So today, Christmas Eve, the miracle of the manger, he is waiting. He's not in the manger anymore, but he is waiting with open arms to receive those who would trust in him and believe. Also to this as we pray, to those who are struggling a little bit along the way, not with your belief that you know you're saved, but you're struggling in some of the things of choices of life, where I need to be, what I need to do. He's there. He doesn't leave. We leave him sometimes. And when those questions come, he's there. And he's there with open arms to receive you. And in this prayer today, if you don't know him, please believe in him. And the second part of that, believe in him for your life. I know you say, well, I'm, I'm a believer. But yet, know that he's there. Know that if you have a need, go to him. If you've got questions on what to do, he is the answer. Jesus is the answer for the world today. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for the privilege to share today. Thank you for this special time we've gathered here within our church. But most of all, Lord, I never take this, uh, this responsibility for granted. Lord, as we share your word today, I pray that this message has been a blessing 
and I pray that we've honored you. As we close this prayer today, we thank you for this special season. But today, we pray for decisions, those that may need to make decisions for salvation or those that may need to make decisions related to just their walk. This is a wonderful time of the year. This can be done anytime, but today, as the Word says, today is the day of salvation. What a blessed time to join the kingdom in this Christmas Eve and Christmas season. Thank you for your word today. Thank you for the encouragement, Lord, that uh, it is. And Lord, I pray that you'll bless those that will make decisions and let them live for you and give them guidance. Lord, you love us. I thank you for your love for us. And Lord, we celebrate you today. In Jesus' name, amen.